Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of the church here. Good to have you all with us today. Um, since it's not Advent yet, that means that our common ground schedule remains the same for this week. Uh, the following week, though, remember we have our midweek Advent services from 6 to 6.30 each week. Um, I have the midweek Advent services this year, um, and I've done a little bit something, something a little bit different. Um, the sermon during that time will actually be a dialogue sermon, uh, and we're going to look at the phrase of where it says, the angels, you know, said, born unto you in the city of David is a Savior Christ the, King, uh, Christ the Lord. And so we're going to look at those Savior Christ and Lord words and what they meant to the people back then. So, um, in addition to that then, a uh, reminder that we do have a special voters meeting next Sunday after our late service. Next Sunday is also the LWML Fall Mission Festival uh, with a bratwurst lunch as well, so plan on staying for that. Uh, we have Advent devotionals for you uh, to pick up if you want, and order the poinsettias because they will be uh, used to decorate the uh, chancel area soon as well. Then, uh, Let's begin our worship service today then by uh, standing and singing our opening hymn, I'll Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We kneel or sit for confession. Let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We stand to sing God's praise. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you. be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, merciful Father, you have appointed your Son as judge of the living and the dead. Enable us to wait for the day of his return with our eyes fixed on the kingdom prepared for your own from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for this morning is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, beginning at verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. 
There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Therefore, says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with your side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, for also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, we invite our children forward for a children's message. Well, good morning. I'm glad that you made it here on this snowy day. Well, I have a question for you. How many of you love to wait for something fun and exciting to happen? How about you're in the ice cream store and there's a long line and you're waiting to get your ice cream cone? Is that, is that hard to wait? How about you're sitting in school and it's almost summertime? Is that hard to wait for summer to come? Yeah. How about waiting for your birthday? Is that hard? Yeah. What's our next holiday coming up? Is that hard to wait for Christmas? It seems like it's never going to get here. Well, we know that a long time ago, before Jesus was born, God promised his people that he was going to send a Savior, and he would save his people from their sins. And these people waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited so long, they thought, oh, it's never going to happen. We're never going to see this Savior, this Jesus. But then on Christmas, we celebrate what? Jesus' birthday. God did fulfill his promise, and he sent Jesus. Well, Jesus was a little boy, and then he grew up and be became a man. But he didn't stay on earth, did he? He went back to heaven to prepare a place for us. So now, again, we are waiting because God said, I will send Jesus back again. 
And this time, he's going to take all of us to be with him in heaven. And it's going to be so exciting and fun. It's hard to wait. But we can wait. And how we wait for Jesus is we can, while we're waiting, we can work for him. We can love him. We can worship him. We can serve him. We can listen to our parents when they tell us to do something. All of those things are helping wait for Jesus. So... When we do these things, then we will be ready for Jesus to come back again. So let's fold our hands and say a prayer. Dear Jesus, help us to wait patiently for you. Help us to work while we wait for you to come again. Amen. Before you go back, I have a little Advent calendar for you, and every day you Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel as we sing the verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer to him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and and feed you? or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you. Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We continue our worship by singing the hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you are the divine shepherd. You separate sheep from goats, but we thank you, Lord, that you have made us a part of your eternal flock through the gift of baptism and the gift of faith which you have worked in us. Keep us firm to the end so that we may enjoy that eternal home that you have prepared for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. If I would ask people to conjure up an image of Jesus, more than likely we would get those common descriptions. You know, like gentle Jesus, meek and mild, lover of children, carrier of cuddly lambs on the shoulders, shepherd of the flock, traversing the green hillside under a blue sky. Oh, some may give us more focus on uh, Jesus the macho man as he uh, turns over the tables in the temple and rails at the Pharisees. Others may also give us a bloody Jesus hanging on the cross. But I doubt if anyone would conjure up an image of Jesus as a hulking giant who could stomp through a town like a divine Godzilla. That is, if you don't live in the Polish town of Sweet Bodson. Because there in that town stands a 170-foot Jesus looming over the town with people hoping that he doesn't fall on them and crush them as they go to the local Tesco supermarket. It took over 10 years to build this statue of Jesus, and some say it cost about $3 million to build it. It's one of the most audacious religious icons there built in Europe. He stands taller than the famous uh, Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro. Although the Brazilians would dispute that fact because they say the Polish Jesus is cheating by standing on a mound. But I'll let the my Jesus is bigger than your Jesus for their argument. The Father um, Sylvester Zwadzki was the one who was the architect of this project. And when asked what inspired him or how he got the idea, he just pointed to the supersized Savior and said, it was Jesus' idea. I was simply the builder. Now, not all the people of Sweet Bozen are as sanguine about uh, this Jesus that uh, looms over the town like a mutant messiah. Um, some of them, speaking on anonymity because of the power of the local Catholic church there, um, thought it was an embarrassment at best or a waste of money at the worst there. He was hoping that they would bring some tourism to town, but most people just drive up in their car, jump out, take a picture of others as they, uh, as they try to, uh, again, uh, what, uh, They try to, you know, take a picture of Jesus with his arms outstretched, you know, uh, reflecting his statue there. Then they jump in their car and they leave town without spending any money on the local economy. Which then makes me wonder, is it better to have a soteriological sphinx that dominates the landscape for everyone to see, or is it better to have a Jesus who is innocuous and gentle and sweet and nice. Well, our Old Testament and New Testament lessons for today tell us that neither image is really a correct image, and yet both images tell us about the purpose of Jesus, the one shepherd who does care for his people with gentle love, and protects his people with stand-alone power. Ezekiel depicts Yahweh as a shepherd who maintains justice while protecting his sheep. This 
powerful Jesus is the, is the description of the image that, um, we, that he wants us to hold on to and contrast that image with the one given to by Matthew in the gospel lesson, which gives us a more gentle Jesus who protects his sheep from the goats. But in either case, the shepherd makes those hard choices of separation and judgment so that the sheep may be safe, secure, and thrive. Now, the image of God as a shepherd permeates the Old Testament, most famously, obviously, in Psalm 23 which gives us a picture of the the Lord who makes us lie down in green pastures, who leads us beside still waters, who restores our souls. That image is picked up in Isaiah as well, chapter 40, verse 11, in which it says that the shepherd will feed his flock, that he will gather his lambs into his arms and carry them in his bosom. So gentle care is one of those soft focus images that we get of Jesus in Scripture. But we have to balance that out with the image that Ezekiel gives us of a shepherd who is a warrior, a fighter, one who maintains justice in the flock and yet keeps the flock safe and secure talking about the sheep of Judah who had been captured by or had been scattered by the Babylonians, it says that God will search for his sheep and will seek them out. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And that God did when uh, after the Babylonian captivity captivity, he brought a remnant back to the promised land. That promise God still fulfills today through his church, the one holy Christian and apostolic church, the new promised land. And this he will also one day fulfill in the future, at the end of time, when he establishes the new heavens and the new earth, the restored promised land. Only the one shepherd can do that. Only the divine shepherd can bring unity in this ultra-divided world. But you may think, well, why do we need this divine shepherd? Well, to answer that question, you really have to look at the context, those first 10 verses before our Old Testament lesson. And in the first 10 verses of Ezekiel 34, he talks about the bad shepherds, the ones who don't do God's will. And Ezekiel says the bad shepherds are like the kings of Judah in Israel, that these kings have fail to do even the basic tasks of caring for the flock of God. The indictment is pretty clear. It's said that the bad shepherds slaughter and exploit the sheep and have grown fat and lazy. They fail to strengthen the weak ones, heal the sick and injured, and search for the lost. Because they harass the sheep, the sheep are scattered all over the face of the earth. I mean, even Jesus didn't have much good to say about bad shepherds either, did he? Because he said that, when, uh, that the bad shepherds, that they have no personal investment in the flock at all, so that when the wolf comes, uh, they abandon the sheep and run away like cowards. Why? Because they have no care for the sheep. So that's why Ezekiel presents us a shepherd with a sword in his hand rather than a meek and mild herdsman. We need that image as Christians as we live in this world of ours in the injustice and fraud, in the persecution and malevolence of this world. I mean, there are spiritual leaders today who have sold out to culture just like in the days of Ezekiel. 
And God says that he is against those bad shepherds. That he will demand from them the, his flock back to them from those that devour them. In other words, God is torqued at bad shepherds because they feed themselves and not the flock under their care. So then, God then says that the, that's where we then come to the Old Testament lesson at verse 11, where it starts today. And there, God then shifts from the bad shepherds to his flock, his people, his church. What's bad for the unbeliever is good for the believer. What's bad for the unrepentant, the idolater, the lover of culture, is good for those who are in the flock of the good shepherd. God will judge the bad shepherds who have taken the unfair share of the resources. And he will judge the sheep, as Ezekiel says, as well. Those sheep who have uh, powerful sheep, who have exploited the less powerful, the fat sheep, as he calls them in his lesson here, who have bullied the weak ones, who have taken their resources and soiled what is left over. And God will judge each sheep, the fat and the weak, according to his divine will. How is he going to do that? Well, Ezekiel says he will do that by sending the one shepherd, a descendant of the house of David, who will judge between the sheep and feed those who need it. This one divine shepherd is a descendant, is a, a representative of God himself. And he is the ultimate shepherd king. This descendant of David who slew the giant Goliath will be a giant himself. Not in terms of stature, a physical stature, or in terms of a giant statue, but he will be tall in the order of justice. This divine shepherd will watch over his flock and keep them safe and secure. And that's signaled in the Old Testament lesson by the word that Ezekiel uses for prince. The typical Hebrew word for prince is nagid, but here Ezekiel uses the word nasi, meaning that this prince is not going to be your typical political leader. This prince is righteous. This prince will be savior and servant. This prince will be redeemer, protector, provider. This prince will be the son of the one true Melech, God himself. This shepherd prince will be Jesus. And that's what Jesus does in the New Testament here. Jesus takes on that ministry of the shepherd and cares for the weak and the outcast while challenging the fat and content shepherds and sheep. This God, can, this, in the whole view of the, the end of time given to us in the Gospel of Matthew there, we see the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy where this divine shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus, separates the sheep from the goats so that the sheep may be taken to God's eternal kingdom. Jesus, the divine shepherd, is the one who comes. He is the ultimate shepherd king and he dominates the landscape with his care and concern over the flock you can almost imagine that having a 170 foot jesus uh, looming over the town there uh, that people might feel that god's eyes are always on them because you know uh, uh, at 170 feet uh, you can't uh, be away or out of that side of that person uh, very much 
But that uh, building of the a stupendous uh, stature of Jesus is a, really an exercise in missing the point. Because Jesus isn't supposed to be a tourist attraction. No, our Jesus is a divine shepherd who is with the flock. He doesn't loom over them like some supersized sentinel. Our shepherd is with us. He is among us, listening, caring, challenging, cajoling, just like a good shepherd. So on this Christ the King Sunday, we keep those two images in mind because both of them are important for us. The image of the gentle shepherd who loves us and who will carry us even on his shoulders. And also the warrior shepherd who is jealous over his people and will protect us, even using weapons if necessary. Sure, a 170-foot Jesus would, could be imitate, uh, in, uh, intimidating, but... It's nothing compared to the real Jesus who abides with us, who loves us, who cares for us, who protects us, keeps us in his flock until that day that he brings us to our eternal home. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and make confession of the faith that we have with one another in our triune God by speaking together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we do worship our Lord through the gathering of our tithes and offerings. And if you filled out your attendance card and haven't placed them in the offering plate, we invite you to do so at this time as well. We worship our Lord through our tithes and offerings. Please stand for prayer. Shepherd King, you gather your people from all nations and bring them into your one holy Christian and apostolic flock. Strengthen them by your grace that they may gladly feast upon your riches in your means of grace and declare your praises to all who will hear. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, you have subjected all things under the Good Shepherd, who gladly subjects himself to you. Bless the homes of your people, that parents may train and teach their children with wisdom and love, 
and that children may gladly submit and honor to their father and mother. Lord, in your mercy, O Lord of lords, you sustain every rule, authority, and power as you see fit until the world's powers should pass away. Bless all in civil authority, that they would not provoke your wrath by governing against your divine will, but maintain godly order and a righteous justice for the peace of your people. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness, while now we contend with a multitude of afflictions under the curse of sin. Remember those in need and healing, especially Brenda Banta, David Doffenbach, Vic Gerke, Sue Grassau, and Scott Roberts. Preserve them, deliver them from their afflictions, and hold them in your shepherd's care. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have prepared your kingdom for us from the foundation of the world. Preserve us in faith and love throughout our days, that we may care for your servants and our neighbors with compassion and joy, looking toward that day when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.